Hello, you're watching Entertainment Week. Coming up on the show, director Michael Winterbottom on how the Amanda Knox trial inspired his new film, Face of an Angel. Russell Crowe tells us about stage fright and stepping behind the camera for the water diviner. A new direction for the world's biggest boy band, as Zane quits. And documentary maker Nick Broomfield reveals LA's seedy underbelly in his new film. First, let's catch up on the week's entertainment news. There is flash photography coming up. Zayn Malik left One Direction fans devastated after quitting the band to be what he described as a normal 22-year-old. He says the decision feels right. Jeremy Clarkson was dropped by the BBC as host of Top Gear following an altercation with the show's producer. Angelina Jolie revealed she had surgery to remove her ovaries as a preventative measure against cancer. Lil Chris, the star of reality show Rock School, died aged 24. Police are not treating the death of the singer, real name Chris Hardman, as suspicious. James Corden won American audiences over as he made his debut as host of The Late Late Show. It was announced the sixth series of Downton Abbey will be its last. Sam Taylor Johnson has said she won't direct the sequels to Fifty Shades of Grey. US network Fox has confirmed Mulder and Scully will be back for six new episodes of The X-Files this summer. And Joan Collins received her damehood from Prince Charles for services to charity. And to discuss some of those stories is entertainment journalist Steve Hargrave. Steve, great to see you. Now, Zayn Malik, he mm. quit One Direction to be a normal 22-year-old. Normal? Who wants to be normal? I mean, is this a good idea? <laughs> I, you know, I think it kind of it swung around a little bit because <clears throat> initially everyone said he's quit to go into obscurity and just kind of, and I guess... Because of stress. Yeah, because of stress. So there was this kind of serious un, uh, sort of thing underpinning it, but... We now know that he, he's kind of quit because he basically wants to do his own thing musically. So he is working on solo material, although he says he's not going to rush it, but he's already been pictured going to the studio. So there perhaps is a slightly different reason emerging from what we initially had. And Zane himself has said in the interview that he gave... Because uh, he's, he's spoken to the Sun. He's spoken to the Sun newspaper, yeah, who got this interview with him, and he, and he said that it basically he just didn't want to do any more and hadn't wanted to do it for a while. So I think what we're seeing, and we see it quite a lot, they're 22-year-old guys having to get on stage and sing pop songs to kids. A lot of 22-year-old guys don't like this sort of music. So I think it's just someone being a bit more truthful with themselves, separating the business from what he wants to do mm -hmm. and saying, I like hip-hop. I think I want to rap. Mm -hmm. I don't want to stand on stage and do that every night, so I'm going to go off and do my own thing. He's already, like, he's grown his beard again and he was spotted smoking a cigarette. So I think he's sort of that chance to let loose a bit. Uh, also leaving uh, a group, uh, Top Gear's Jeremy <laughs> Clarkson, uh, the Director General of the BBC, has not renewed his contract. Uh, I mean, what's the latest on how, where the show's going to go, where Jeremy Clarkson's going to go? I think, uh, yeah, Clarkson's still been quite quiet on the issue. It was this big build about whether he'd go. He had to go. We knew that was always going to happen. I guess attention now turns to whether Hammond and may go it looks at the moment that they will go and not be a part of the top gear brand or more interestingly from a media point of view where will the trio if they go as a trio end up there was talk about um, netflix you know this we, we talk about it constantly this new way of delivering tv will they go in that direction and who will replace them on top gear because that's a tough gig to fill yeah chris evans was the favorite he's already ruled himself chris out, evans ruled himself out i think we've got nick knowles now jody kidd interestingly going uh, down a female angle uh, angle and stephen fry was the uh, the other option he's so always in the mix somewhere he's isn't always he? in the mix it would be it would be very different i'll say that <laughs> steve thanks very much now, the trial of Amanda Knox and Raphael Selecito for the murder of British student Meredith Kircher has been an enduring source of media fascination. With the case back in the headlines this week, the release of a film inspired by the story has proved timely. Michael Winterbottom's The Face of an Angel looks at how news coverage can influence public perception. They're innocent or they're guilty, and you can't be neutral. When I think of the face of an angel, I always think of Elizabeth. Do you want me and Jessica? She's the story. Hey, Jessica! Jessica! In court, it was made very simple. Jessica was the bad girl, and Elizabeth was a good girl. Michael, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, now, the film is based on the Meredith Kircher case, but is more about the media's portrayal of the case. Is that fair? Yeah, I think so. I think that it's the, the starting point was the media's coverage. There's a massive amount of coverage. You know, besides the news and the, the press, there was, I think, sort of 10 books written about it. There's five or six TV documentaries. So it was one of those cases that sort of seemed to capture people's imagination. So 
the, the starting point for the film is why does the press spend so much time on a story like that? Why do we all spend so much time watching and reading stories like that? And did you come to a conclusion? No, not what, really, Why do we? <laughs> not really. I mean, there, obviously, there are lots of kind of obvious factors that, that are involved in that. But I suppose, for, from my point of view, I think one fact which isn't so obvious is that the press has a huge amount of space to fill. You know, and I think with these kind of trials, that, that they become sort of soap operas. And, and, and from the press point of view or TV's point of view, it's, it's great that you get a story which can run and run. It becomes the characters become like soap opera kind of characters and you can gossip about what happened. There's all this speculation. So I think that is a, the, one of the bad aspects of it, that, that really a, a really important, terrible story becomes trivialised. And why did you decide to make a, a fictional film about it? Why did you not do a documentary if you were looking about, looking at, at the media's portrayal of the case? Because it would have worked very well as a documentary, wouldn't it? Well, I, I guess so. I think it's, it's like I think fiction sometimes can be more intimate than than documentary. You know, you can you can tell the facts of a story in a documentary. It's hard sometimes to really see people in their kind of private moments. It's hard to see people behaving badly. It's hard to sort of see people's kind of emotions. And and although the film starts as being about the press, and and the and the kind of journalists covering the case, I kind of hope by the end of the film. What people are thinking about is just is the, at the heart of a story like this, at the heart of this specific story, a girl had been killed, a girl had lost her life. She was a kind of young girl who had gone to Italy a few weeks before, full of optimism and joy, and, you know, excited for the year ahead. And then whatever happened that night, you know, it, the simple truth is she lost her life. She lost all the chance for kind of happiness. Her pet family had lost their daughter, their sister, and so that aspect of the story, I hope, is like stronger in our film than it, than it certainly was in the press coverage, but that it might be easier to do in a documentary. So you're dealing with very delicate subject matters. You're dealing with, with real-life characters, a, a family who's tragically lost their daughter. And how did you deal with all those aspects of things? Um, well, it's difficult. I think I've done a lot of films based on real people's stories, and you obviously have to treat them with, with respect. I mean, in this case, you know, it's particularly difficult because, because you know, it's about a, a murder. Um, yeah, and, and what in the, in the practical way, what we did was all the elements of the case, the investigation, the trial are exactly the same as the original story, the, the, the murder of Meredith Kircher. So we were very faithful to exactly what happened in that area, and then around that we have a, the kind of fi the world of the fiction of the film of the of our characters, and it's about uh, in a way the parallels between their lives and the, and the lives of the people in the, in the story that they're covering. One of your stars is Cara Delevingne, who we know mainly as a model. She's a bit of a find, isn't she? Uh, she's great. She was fantastic, and you know I've met a lot of really good actors for that part before I met Cara, and you know that I hadn't really found the right person, and then. Cara walked in the door and it was like in the morning she'd flown overnight from the Caribbean or somewhere glamorous and kind of came into a room full of energy and like was really direct and open. I kind of immediately knew she was right for the part. Yeah, she plays a British student and she's supposed to sort of embody all the good things about life. That when you're young you're full of energy and optimism and joy and stuff. Uh, talking of someone else with a lot of energy, um, you're working also with Russell Brand at the moment. <laughs> Uh, what can people expect? Because this is a documentary about the financial crisis out before the election. Sounds very, very interesting. Uh, it's been fun doing. You know, uh, Russell's a uh, really kind of great person. He's full, you know, he, as you say, he is full of energy. He's, he's really committed to like, getting involved with what's going on. You know, as you know, I'm sure you know, he's got, he's got ongoing uh, kind of news alternative to the Sky News, the Trues, and... Uh... Well, he's telling us that no one should vote, isn't he? <laughs> well, no, that's not... I don't think that's fair. That's certainly not the message of our film, and it's not... I don't think it's... It, I think it's really uh, unfair uh, caricature of Russell's position that he goes around telling people not to vote. What he tells people to do is get involved, get active. You know, you know if, you want, if you want to do something about it, get up and get involved. So but essentially, he's about he to, is he's saying, saying get don't involved. vote, no, isn't saying, it? No, he's not. He's essentially saying... He's saying he, he, what he does, has said is, like, you know, if you look at the politicians, who, which one of these would you vote for? And I think that's a pretty fair criticism. But he, it's the opposite. That, that suggests he's going around saying, don't, give, don't, you know, don't care about the, the world, don't care about what's going on around you, don't care about politics. He's actually saying, get, become genuinely involved. Is he hard to edit? <laughs> Is he hard to edit? No, he's not hard to edit at all. He's lovely. Well, we look forward to it. Thank you so much for your time, Michael Winterbottom. Thank Thanks you. So much. Thanks. Now, for an actor who most famously played a gladiator, you wouldn't think there was much that could scare Russell Crowe. But when he stepped behind the camera to direct his first feature film, The Water Diviner, he found his nerves were put to the test. Joe McAltuck went to meet him. What's the magic word? The one that makes
makes the carpet fly. Longer! Tengu, you want back? That's it, Tengu! Come on, cuddle up! Get tight! Close your eyes! You've done close to 50 movies, and I was trying to toss it up on, on the internet. I think it is actually 50. Is it now 50? Yeah, well, there's some, some films that I've done that people don't know about. Okay. <laughs> well, we won't go there, but you've done 50 that we know about. I was young. Yeah. I needed the money. No, you know, but it's, you know in, in my 19-year apprenticeship between the age of 6 and 25, before I actually got lead roles in films, you know, I was an extra. You know, on, on, in many situations. Even though you know how to talk this language, you know how a film set works, you know how films work, mm -hmm. was there still that sense of trepidation from oh, you of the first day? Before we started, three or four days before the shoot started, you know, uh, you just, you're questioning yourself on such a base level, you know, such a deep level, you're going, how am I going to get away with this? You know, will that thing, that ease that I've always had with, film crews and camera crews, will that change now that I'm actually the boss, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I was, you know, nervous beyond belief, like the level of stage fright you couldn't imagine, you know? Yeah, it was a continuous thing where, you know, you're always wondering whether you'll measure up, but that's, you know, to me, I've come to learn that, you know, that nerves, those butterflies, that stage fright is a simple indication that you care deeply about what you're doing. I've obviously got my own perspective, I always have, and some of the directors that I've worked with, particularly probably Ridley Scott and Ron Howard, you know, I know there's elements of what they do that is in a way influenced by me and what we could achieve together, what we have achieved together. You know, I'm doing things on, on film sets that, you know, were cemented in place in my mind 25 years ago, you know, where I know, right, that's the way you do this, that's the way you communicate with actors, this is the way you create a, an intimacy and a bond, you know, and a level of trust. But, you know, there's also, times when you're on a film set, man, where you're looking at somebody doing something and you're going to yourself, I am learning right now that what that person is doing is something that I will never do on a film set. Yeah. You know? So yeah, you take the good with the bad, you know. What's the future just finally? Acting, directing, both? Look man, I used to think I had the greatest job in the world mm -hmm. and then I discovered this. So, you know, if, if it was up to me, there would never be another movie that I'm just acting in, you know. Um, and it's a, it's a funny thing because I love my job. Mm -hmm. You know, but I love this job more. Coming up, is there still magic left in Cinderella? We'll be reviewing it and the rest of the weekend's movies. Nick Broomfield is best known for documentaries on some of the most famous and infamous names in popular culture. But away from films about Courtney Love, Sarah Palin and Tupac, he's explored the dark heart of modern America. His latest project, Tales of the Grim Sleeper, is the story of a serial killer who went undetected on the impoverished streets of South Central LA. It is thought Lonnie might have killed more than 100 women over a 25-year period. I wondered how this was possible. Hi. So you saw him the night before he was arrested? Yeah, I seen him the night before we was talking. He asked me what was I doing. I told him I was going to go clubbing. Well, I got in about 3, woke up about 7, and the whole street was blocked off. Couldn't go nowhere, couldn't do nothing. Just, the street just closed off. I mean, he was a nice guy. Nick, lovely to see you. Yeah. Now tell me about this documentary. Why did you decide to pick this topic? Why this story that you wanted to tell? It, well, it's such an amazing story, I think, that over 25 years, somebody was able to kill, I mean, they, they think maybe over 100 women, uh, sort of completely undetected. And when he was detected, it was by a computer that caught him. It wasn't sort of intrepid. Uh, police work. It was a computer matched his DNA, or actually matched his son's DNA to some of the DNA found on the victims. They worked out the son was too young to have done many of the murders, which went back to sort of 1985. So they worked out it must have been Lonnie, and they followed him to a, a pizza place and grabbed, managed to get a bit of his discarded pizza and then matched the DNA up. So it wasn't as though the police had been actively pursuing him and found him by some way or, you know, it was, it was when he was finally caught after 25 years, it was kind of an accident. So, I mean, you live there. Is it like two cities living side by well, side? Well, it is. It's two very different cities. I mean, 
not only have they vastly different employment rates, I mean, there's sort of 80% unemployment in South Central, there's incredible obesity, people die about 25 years younger than any other part of Los Angeles. Um, so it's just very, and I think the, the rift has gotten much worse. I think uh, all the federal funding has been cut off. So it's very hard for people to get out of there. And it's very hard for people, for example, to sell their houses because their houses are worth virtually nothing. No one wants to move into the area, so they can't really move out. So people are stuck in that community for years and years and years. And I think, you know, it, it was a timely film to make because obviously with Ferguson and some of the other things happening, there is an awareness that there is a kind of institutionalized negligence. You know, if you haven't got money, you know, and you don't matter, nothing very much happens. How do you stay sort of objective in some ways? Because you obviously really like the people in this film. Yeah. You didn't like Sarah Palin. You didn't like Courtney Love. How do you kind of tell the story? How does it, how does it change when you like the subjects involved? Well, I mean, it's a lot, it's obviously a lot more fun to make films about people you like. And it's, you know, you enjoy spending time with them mm. and I think there's more of a rapport and you learn things I mean I think the film about uh, Courtney Love that was really more a film about um, all the attempts at corporate America kind of you know it was like because Kurt was worth so much money and he was on the Time Warner label and he was also part of MTV and he was a, I was losing half my funding during the making of the film. You know, I remember MTV pulled out because Courtney was putting pressure on them. And really? yeah, so it became a film more about, you know, um, how difficult it is to make a film about somebody who's very famous, who's worth a great deal of money, because nearly all the companies are invested in their success. So, you know, it's easy to make a film about these kinds of people, about, you know, Tells the Grim Sleep, which is a poor community, completely unrepresented. Mm. But it's very difficult to make a, a sort of brutally honest film about somebody who's worth a great deal of money, like, mm. you know, the Kurt Cobains or the Courtney's. And I would think with a lot of the films that you make, you, you, you think, I couldn't make this up. Yeah, I think each film is sort of an adventure. I mean, you, you think you know why you're making it at the beginning, but you've got no idea how it's going to end, going to end up. And I think, you know, Tales of the Grim Sleeper was surprising about that. I mean, I didn't really know whether he was innocent or guilty. I didn't really know very much about the community. I had no, you, you don't know what characters you're going to meet. Mm -hmm. And I think what is so interesting, if you have the privilege to be able to make films in this way, is that you can take an audience on this incredible adventure to meet all these incredible characters mm -hmm. that they would never imagine meeting. It's totally fascinating. Thank you so much for your Thank time. Thank you. Mike. Time now to see what's on at the movies this weekend, and the big release is Disney's remake of Cinderella. Remember, the magic will only last so long. With the last echo of the last bell, at the last stroke of midnight, the spell will be broken, and all will return to what it was before. Midnight. Hmm? Midnight. That's more than enough time. <laughs> Off you go, then. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Goosey, go! And I'm joined now by the film critic Jason Solomon. It's lovely to see nice you. Nice to see you, Lizzie. Now, Lily James is Cinderella, and the most column inches have gone to the size of her waist. Yes, I know, which is a bit of a waste, to be honest, because there's a lot else to talk about. I, di I didn't think she was too thin, if that's anything to go by, but, you know, with fairy tale her heroines, you know, what are we supposed to do in the modern age? They're supposed to kind of live up to those kind of frozen ideals of Anna and her sister. And, you know, why are we remaking something from the 1950s? It's got the talking mice. Everything that you wanted in your Disney movie uh, is in here, too. Uh, and it's directed by Kenneth Branagh, and I think he's done a very nice job with it. I mean, it's kind of like him doing panto a bit. So right. I really felt like, you know, there was, you know, a Christmassy feel to it because it has the magic. But, you know, Lily James is, is oh, faintly annoying as Cinderella, to be honest. But I think that's the part. That's the, quite the way it is. What you really watch it for is for the incidental stuff, the costumes by Sandy Powell, which are magnificent. And Helena the people, Bonham Carter Helena is Bonham amazing, the fairy godmother, and Kate Blanchett mm. as the sort of evil stepmother, who is brilliant. I mean, the, the film picks up immensely when those two are on the screen, as, as the Disney film does too. You know, the devil always gets the best lines in the Disney movies, and the fairy godmother's great, bibbidi bobbidi boo in Cinderella. And the mice are pretty good too. This has done fantastically at the American box office. 
in particular, maybe because, I mean, the preamble to the film is a frozen short. That's right, frozen fever, which everyone's desperate for frozen two, aren't they? And they, they, they said that they're going to do a little coming, short. Yeah. Frozen two is coming, but to kind of placate that massive audience, the biggest cartoon of all time, they put it at the front of Cinderella, frozen fever, a little short. It's delightful, it's really fun. Uh, Face of an Angel is probably, you probably are the audience for this. Did you like it? <laughs> Face of an Angel is Michael Winterbottom's uh, study, kind of take on the Meredith Kirchner Amanda Knox case, except it's not. It's not about that. It's not even set in Perugia. It's set in Siena, mm. just down the road. Uh, it's a thinly veiled kind of uh, look at what happened in this case, at how the media have taken it, the, the filmmakers, like Michael Winterbottom, making a, a film, how difficult it is to get to the truth of this. I think it's a very interesting take on these kind of big murder cases, how we all take sides and how different newspapers take sides and different websites take sides. Yeah. And of course, you've now got the extra layer of Michael Winterbottom, the filmmaker, taking sides. He's one of the only filmmakers that could make a murder trial about uh, a sort of dead English girl all about himself. Mm. Uh, finally, Seventh Son. Now, before we hear from you, let's take a look. Did you miss me? You have, haven't you? Don't try to deny it. I can see into your soul. No! Yeah! So this is Julianne Moore, fresh from her Oscar win, in what looks like, well, I don't know, you describe it to me, dragons, I, I mean, it looks a bit like Game of Thrones. I've seen it, I still don't know what it's about. It's funny because oh, really you, you've, you've got, you know, you win an Oscar and sometimes it, it's the crowning glory of your career, sometimes yeah. it's a curse, you know. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Bridges is in this as well, you know, he won an Oscar for Crazy Heart, he hasn't been in a decent movie since. What happens is your price goes up, so all those cool indie movies that you were doing all the way up till you get your Oscar, you now, they can't now afford you, so your agent dumps you in these big blockbusters because your name sells these tickets. Uh, and, and you end up in nonsense. I can't understand what you're talking about. Jeff Bridges sounds like he's doing Winston Churchill doing an impression of Yoda. Julianne Moore's like a witch with eyes and hair and there's monsters and dragons. It is absolute nonsense. I've got no idea. Then German Huns who turns up, everyone runs away. Olivia Williams turns up wearing Alicia Hessian. Alicia Vikander, Alicia is Vikander. a real hot talent. Yeah, she's a hot talent moment. in this and looks completely lost in this and she's kind of got this buxom <laughs> outfit on and she's not buxom at all. It's a, it's a real Miss Ben Barnes who's really boring in it. It sounds absolutely appalling. I, I mean, I wish I knew what was going on. I I do not know. I, head nor tail, and Julianne Moore has got a tail in this film uh, uh, that kills people. I, I don't know what it was about. It's a seventh son. It's just about a ghost hunter and a demon. It's as if they went, uh, just, just get on with it. You've got Julianne Moore, go and sell some tickets. I don't. I think it's a disaster. It's a, it's a really horrible film. That sounds horrendous. Well, it sounds like your pick of the week is definitely Cinderella, then. Well, I know that sounds a bit kind of girly, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I enjoyed it. We'll go with that one. Thank you so much, Jason. <laughs> and that is all for this week. If you've missed any of the show, it's available anytime on Catch Up. See you next time.